Hello, my name's Brian Handy. I work in the nuclear power industry as a consultant in physical chemistry. The title of the talk, Chemistry in the Nuclear Industry, is a very broad topic. I'm going to concentrate on pressurised water reactors because that's the one we're building at the moment in the UK. The presentation is in two parts. This session is just part one and I'm going to just consider normal operation of the PWR. Now the chemistry areas that uh, are covered in the nuclear power industry, the sort of areas that a chemist might be involved in are shown on this slide. The uranium enrichment, fuel fabrication, power station construction and commissioning, reactor operation, accident chemistry, decommissioning and of course safety case writing. Now nuclear power is an alternative to fossil fuel and the worldwide reactors are are predominantly water-cooled reactors, in other words, pressurised water reactors or boiling water reactors. The current UK programme, we have um, a PWR being constructed at Hinkley Point. Uh, there's one under consideration, safety case being prepared at Sizewell, and also at uh, Bradwell. So I'm going to move on to uh, normal operation and we'll leave the accident chemistry for a future presentation. But first, uh, let's consider how the PWR works. You could see on the left hand side there, the, the red flowing line represents the primary coolant going over the core, picks up heat, and this is transferred to the steam generator via steam, steam generator tubes. Generate steam which in turn uh, turns the turbine and which generates electricity. The steam from the uh, uh, turbine is condensed with seawater cooling and returned to the steam generator. So typical PWR operating conditions at the primary side, we have a, about 160 bar and it operates at about 300 centigrade. The primary flow is about 20 tonnes a second. The secondary pressure, that's the steam generator, uh, 70 bar, and operates at about 285. These are all design dependent, of course. These, these are just typical figures. Now, the sort of power you might expect, for example, at size will be, there's an 1100 megawatt unit, but the units at Hinkley Point C and size will C are going to be 1600 megawatt units. Now for the chemistry side, the primary circuit control focuses on the three main areas here, that, that's the pH control, hydrogen and the impurities. Now for pH, uh, boric, boric acid is added to the primary coolant. Uh, this is uh, to introduce uh, the isotope boron-10 into the coolant and that's to control the reactivity of the core itself, i.e. it controls the neutron flux, it acts as a chemical shim. But we neutralise this or, or, or make the, uh, uh, the coolant alkaline by adding lithium hydroxide. This is um, depleted in lithium-6, in other words it's uh, uh, lithium, mainly lithium-7 hydroxide, and that's because the B10N alpha reaction produces lithium-7, so, so there's no extra fond material being introduced into the system. For hydrogen, that's added to maintain reducing conditions. Not only does it exclude oxygen, but it also prevents oxidising free radical formation from the radiolysis of water. And then finally impurities, um, anions, cations and particulates are taken out. Uh, this is to uh, minimise uh, potential corrosion problems problems in the primary circuit. There are other chemistry issues of course. Um, there's a move towards using enriched boron in uh, reactors. The, the boron-10 isotope is only 19.6% abundant. If you can enrich that it means that you need less lithium hydroxide to neutralize it, which is an advantage. Cobalt activation occurs uh, this um, occurs through two main routes really. The in canal tubing is, is made of uh, a nickel based alloy, so the cobalt 
58 is uh, produced from the neutron activation of nickel. The reactor internals are stainless steel, so you have uh, invariably you have cobalt impurity in there, and also hard facing alloys. Uh, Use, such as stellite are used in valve seats and um, stellite is a cobalt based alloy. During commissioning the construction passivation and hot functional tests need to be considered and during operation tritium I mentioned uh, uh, lithium-6 could be a source of tritium that needs to be minimized and um, carbon-14 from the O17 which is naturally present in the water Zinc addition is used, and this is to inhibit activated corrosion products from absorbing into the oxide layers on the primary circuit surfaces. You have a sort of spinel structure, and the zinc takes the place of the cobalt um, and, and uh, prevents radioactive substances from depositing. Now, hydrogen control, I mentioned with radi radiolysis of water, a whole host of free radicals are produced, some oxidising, some reducing. There are about um, 30 reactions in the mechanism, but overall you're entering an oxidising environment with, when, with water radiolysis. And the G values for producing and oxidising uh, free radicals and molecules are shown below there, 2.8 for, for radicals, for um, oxidizing radicals, 2.7 for reducing radicals. We're going to talk about this in the next presentation on the accident chemistry. Well, this uh, graph shows how effective hydrogen is. You don't need very much hydrogen system to mop up the oxygen, but what's more important is the hydrogen there to mop up free radicals from the radiolysis of water, for example, HO2. And you can see from the blue the blue diamond there, uh, that, that uh, you need about uh, um, 35 cc's per kilogram, that's 35 cc's at uh, STP, and that's uh, normal operating conditions for a PWR. Now for uh, pH control, the criteria for this is uh, maintaining, uh, we're trying to minimise any deposition of corrosion products on the core because uh, within the neutron flux these become activated. So if you've, if you've got nickel ferrite for example as, or a substitute, some other substituted ferrite as your deposited oxide, you're, you could produce cobalt 58 from nickel 58, the MP reaction, cobalt 60 from cobalt 59, cobalt uh, iron 55 and manganese 54 from, from iron. So to minimise the deposition, one well, adjusts the pH so that the temperature coefficient of solubility of these oxides is always positive. As water passes over the core, it obviously picks up heat, it gets hotter. So if you've got a positive temperature coefficient of solubility, you're, you're in a um, dissolution regime, if you like. On the other hand, if your uh, temperature coefficient of solubility is negative, you're entering a deposition regime, which, which is not so good. And here it shows the dependence of uh, nickel solubility on hydrogen. Now, in normal operating conditions, on the left-hand side there, you see hydrogen at 35 cc per kilogram. And for a, sort of a, range, a whole range of pHs that you might be operating, those curves are, are always positive. So in other words, you have a positive temperature coefficient of solubility. On the other hand, if you don't add hydrogen, or it's significantly less than 35, on the right-hand side, you can see that the gradient of those curves is negative. So you're, you're entering a deposition mode there over the similar range of pH. And uh, the optimum pH, uh, based on nickel ferrite solubility, is 7.4. Um, and you could see on the right-hand side of this diagram that the boron and the lithium are coordinated 
to give this uh, pH of uh, 7.4. Remember that the boron is taken out during the fuel cycle, because as the fuel's burnt up, the react reactivity gets less, so you need uh, less boron, or less boron 10, to control the neutron flux. Now, on the other hand, on, on the left-hand side, you, you have a horizontal line, and this is because there are restrictions on the amount of lithium you can place into the circuit. The fuel vendors specify a maximum of 3.5 uh, ppm because lithium tends to attack the zircaloy cladding. The zircaloy cladding is a zirconium-based alloy which contains the fuel. Now the determination of the pH, this is actually, can actually be calculated so you, you can uh, work out how much lithium you need for a given boric acid concentration. And um, boric acid exists in uh, several forms, polyborates in fact, and the most important ones are the, are the monoborate, the diborate and the triborate. And they, they can be shown by the first equation on the uh, on the top there as an equilibrium, and the equilibrium constants uh, are defined also by the species given by the, the the second row of equations there for B1, B2, and B3. We also know the solubility uh, products of water as well as the literature values for these equilibrium constants. So you can just set up a, a charge balance equation and a mass balance equation and with a bit of algebra uh, you end up with a, uh, an expression for the hydrogen ion concentration for a given lithium. Now this is a, I'll point out this is an iterative calculation. You, you put your first uh, guess if you like of hydrogen then do an iteration um, and uh, feedback the, the answer again and, until the whole thing converges. Now impurity control is carried out with the chemical and volume control system. This system is in the auxiliary building, which is outside the containment, and a, a small letdown flow, primary coolant flow, is taken into the CVCS, which operates at around uh, uh, 2 bar and 45 centigrade, that's after it, it passes through the main heat exchanger. And the CVCS will take out uh, particulates via filter, it contains a cation resin for lithium control and cesium removal, and also sodium removal. An anion resin, which is operate, operated in the borate form, takes out iodine removal, which is an important fission product. Things like chlorides, which, which can give uh, um, corrosion problems, and similarly sulfates. There's also a mixed bed, which takes out both anions and cations. In the CVCS, there's a chemical addition tank where one can add peroxide. Peroxide is added at shutdown and this is to accelerate the oxidation of the coolant before the vessel head is lifted. It has a capacity of adding hydrazine which is added at startup for mopping up the initial oxygen in the system and of course it's used to add lithium at the beginning of the fuel cycle. The volume control tank is there for hydrogen control. In other words, you, you create a partial pressure at equilibrium of hydrogen in the volume control tank to maintain the hydrogen levels in the coolant. But it's also there to, to remove fission gases, things like xenon and krypton. And these are flushed out and sent to the gas waste processing system. And so to summarise, chemistry is applied to many areas within the nuclear industry. And this current presentation is focused on pressurised water reactors and in particular PWR normal operation. As I said, accident chemistry will be considered in a further presentation. But for normal operation, the main parameters are pH control, maintaining reducing conditions and impurity control. And uh, the aim of that is, is plant integrity, reduction of waste and reduction of radiation levels. Now, advice for early careers, uh, and I'm, I'm going to repeat this in the in the accident chemistry presentation as well, since it's they're linked. Um, chemistry within the nuclear power industries is multidisciplinary, 
and one needs to embrace the uh, following areas the physics in other words the basic nuclear physics the engineering side how the plant operates chemical engineering and we're going to talk about uh, um, that next time mass transfer the and the associated mathematics in other words the mathematical treatment of uh, uh, fission products for example and also the development of uh, presentation skills uh, is important for example written report production and all presentations well i'm going to finish there and uh, i hope you found that uh, interesting and uh, i look forward to speaking again to you